In this lecture, we're going to take a look at the Thirty Years' War from 1618, 1648. And I think one of the big questions, um, as we've seen before, is why did religion cause one of Europe's most destructive wars to date? And then how did this war, in effect, reshape um, Europe, um, that is, the institutions and the beliefs of Europe as it began to emerge uh, more clearly uh, from the medieval period and into a period that I've already mentioned several times in class um, called the modern period. So that's really kind of the question we want to be able to answer uh, at the end. Now, this is a very long and complex war. Uh, with many different stages and different players involved. So uh, it is going to be a little bit uh, difficult. Your textbook gives you a, a pretty good overview of this war as well. So um, if there are any questions, uh, you might uh, check back with your uh, textbook reading. Okay, um, I think this picture here by uh, Peter Paul Rubens, uh, painted between 1628-29, uh, uh, War Comes to Europe. Uh, kind of captures the idea, and you can see different uh, um, images there of, of what should be peace, what should be wisdom, um, and they are being sort of um, swept away by the passion and fury that you can see there on the right with that uh, figure holding a torch, uh, and the other figure uh, kind of looking up to the heavens uh, for relief. Um, and then kind of the people down below being trampled uh, upon. So I think this 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 artwork uh, kind of sets the stage for us um, and gives us an idea of just the great deal of uncertainty, the great deal of fear uh, that were instilled uh, then and, and today. Um, so um, here we have um, a couple of images that I'll be talking about uh, as we begin the narration of this lecture. Um, this was the last and most destructive of all the religious wars in Europe. Religious and political differences, as you well know, had long been a source of instability in the Holy Roman Empire and in other areas of Europe, including France and the Netherlands and England as well. Uh, the Holy Roman Empire, though, is going to be the particular scene of this ghastly 30 years of fighting. And I think it's useful to remember that the Holy Roman Empire was not a well-consolidated uh, empire, uh, and therefore um, it's a composite state uh, with an elected emperor and therefore very powerful nobles and also uh, church figures um, that helped um, elect the emperor, but also helped to run the empire. And these individual nobles, princes, uh, landgraves, uh, etc., bishops, um, all wanted to defend fiercely their, their rights, their liberties that they had enjoyed for uh, a long time. So in short, um, the Holy Roman Empire then was the perfect petri dish for religious germs to grow into open political conflict. And this became a climactic struggle to see who would then control not only the empire, but also the continent. And I think we have to remember that the Holy Roman Empire emperors of the Habsburg dynasty had always nurtured this dream of recreating one Europe with one faith um, to restore that idea of order and stability. And so there's this ancient dream that that runs into this uh, political reality that I think you see on the map and this idea of the Petri dish. Um, so these wars stretched over a period of 30 years, 1618 to 1648, uh, and they brought untold misery and death to millions of Europeans. And historians estimate that upwards of 40% of the population in the areas of the Holy Roman Empire um, died either due to war directly or to famine uh, and disease um, that are all caused by major wars uh, uh, at the time. Um, and in the end, um, we see that the contestants, uh, the Catholic versus the Protestants, uh, fought themselves to a standstill. Um, and they're eventually going to work out a peace treaty, though it takes them five years to do so, uh, in 1648. Um, and I think the, it's also worth remembering here that the conflict also uh, was really another uh, extension of a dynastic war. That is, we, we must remember that, yes, there are 
nation states and there are empires, but um, really these nation states are always represented by a dynastic family. And it's no different here in the Thirty Years' War. Uh, you can see up on the uh, in these pictures the two major families um, that were warring with one another in the Habsburg family on the left and then the Wittelsbach family uh, on the right. Um, so yes, this is uh, a war of, of religion and religious zeal and fervor uh, and that idea that truth claims are at the heart of this war. But uh, we also have to remember that we have these dynasties that are duking it out um, to see who could again assert control and sovereignty over uh, much of Europe. Uh, and so the Wittelsbach elector was um, uh, named Frederick V of the Palatine, and he was a Calvinist convert. Um, and he is going to confront a series of rivals. Um, and it's really interesting because the Wittelsbach family itself uh, divided along religious lines. So at one point we had the Wittelsbach elector Frederick V, uh, a Calvinist, uh, challenging his Wittelsbach cousin, who's the Duke of Bavaria, and who is very Catholic. Um, so we see that cousins are going to go to war to defend their uh, ideas of, of worship and to, to promote their ideas of faith. Um, and, and this is going to be something that we see um, throughout um, the Thirty Years' War. Um, so with that being said, we can move over and we see there uh, pictured the two individuals that I just mentioned. And I also tried to uh, point out with those uh, pointers uh, the areas that they ruled. Uh, the Palatinate is a much smaller area than Bavaria, uh, but the Palatine uh, or the Palatinate is going to be sort of the epicenter of events um, that get things going uh, in 1618. But there's a little bit of, uh, of a run-up um, that we're going to look at before then. But I think, again, you see that map of Germany, and it should be clear that um, this is a very composite state. Um, now we're going to skip over this map uh, of modern Europe, and we're going to jump into this next topic, and that, I, that is the idea of a fragmented uh, Germany. So the Holy Roman Empire uh, consisted of some 360 independent political uh, territories, and ecclesiastical towns. And the Peace of Augsburg of 1555 had established the right of princes to choose uh, their own faith in their own lands, but it was a limited choice, Lutheranism or Catholicism. That is, there's no recognition of Calvinism, and yet we know that Calvinism had grown quickly and was extremely attractive uh, to nobles, to princes, uh, and it had grown to uh, uh, such an extent that it was really going to be the Calvinism that was going to provide the spark that lit the fuse that led to the explosion uh, of this war. And, and that's going to happen in the Palatine. Uh, and we already talked about the Wittelsbach family of the Pal Palatinate, which from the 1550s had been strong champions of uh, Reformed churches. At first the Lutheran church, and then um, they convert to the Calvinist church. Um, and there's another prince that's worth mentioning, uh, and that is Christian of Anhalt, uh, who was, again, a devout, a devout uh, and devoted father of Calvin. And Christian of Anhalt's going to influence greatly Frederick V of the Palatine to sort of embark on this holy crusade to defend the Protestant Calvinist faith, but also to extend the Protestant Calvinist uh, faith. And you can see there in the uh, lower right-hand corner um, the idea of of um, the Palatine there, the, the, the pinkish area to the left, and then another area we're going to be talking about, Bohemia to the right. Uh, up above in that map of Europe, you can also see the different uh, faith uh, denominations or confessions, as they were called, that uh, uh, pop up uh, across Europe. And you can begin to see, in fact, the European map is divided um, not only along dynastic and political lines, but also along uh, religious lines. And that's the point of that. Um, so another fact uh, about the uh, idea of the Holy Roman Empire was that many of these um, independent principalities exercised um, autonomy in trade, in taxes, and in tolls that they leveled uh, to travelers and goods traveling about and through their lands. Uh, and Germany was a central location, and there is a dense network of trade that connected the western part of Europe with the eastern parts of Europe, the northern parts of Europe, and the southern parts of Europe. So Germany is sort of a, a major 
Trade Hub. Um, and these princes are going to um, often work to uh, oppose any attempt by the Habsburg uh, dynasty to restrict their rights and liberties and trade, travel, and also religion. Um, and that's going to come into conflict then with the idea of the Council of Trent. 1563, and the Council of Trent revitalized and re-energized the Catholic Church, and remember that the Habsburgs are the preeminent Catholic family in Europe. So we're going to have a, a series of, of conflicts, or at least tensions, that develop um, starting in the 1550s with the Peace of Augsburg, and then the Council of Trent in 1563, that then are going to uh, pit the emperors of the Habsburg family against their own princes. And, and lo and behold, we're going to see that the various German princes, in an effort to fend off the Habsburg uh, uh, dynasty, are going to look elsewhere for help. And they're going to look to the French. They're going to look to the Swedish. They're going to look to the, the Danes. They're going to look to the people of the Netherlands and the English. So what happens um, is, as we saw in France and in the Netherlands, what, what starts is an internal uh, conflict with divisions within the Holy Roman Empire um, is going to wind up as a major geopolitical uh, affair that's going to draw in numerous nations uh, in Europe in this conflict. And one of the greatest things that's going to cause and drive um, these conflicts will be religion. So again, there are other uh, uh, factors involved in the Thirty Years' War, but I think that the primary reason that there is a war um, comes back down to religious divisions and, and fighting over um, the idea of truth claims. Um, and we're going to look at now this next map of Europe, and I think it shows very clearly um, the religious divisions that existed. And um, as you read in your textbook, by about 1600, there are roughly the same number of Lutherans as there were Catholics. Um, and these lands that you see in the Holy Roman Empire are going to shift back and forth between Catholic, Lutheran, and now Calvinist. Um, so uh, that is that is the situation, I think. So what we're trying to do here is develop the context within which this major war uh, breaks out in 1618. And I think you can see very clearly here the divisions um, that obtained in uh, the early uh, 1600s uh, in Europe. And again, I think what this does is, or at least it should send the, uh, the message that there's a great deal of anxiety. There's a great deal of uncertainty. If one is a Catholic uh, and, and being challenged by Calvinists, um, will one be able to retain uh, his or her ability to practice the Catholic faith. On the other hand, um, the Catholics are obviously trying to exterminate um, the Calvinists and or Lutherans. So um, people were very, very concerned about this. Um, and, and that's the starting point. So we're going to continue now uh, to really be, zero in, as I've done here or tried to do here on this slide, um, the idea of the Palatinate and uh, Calvinism. So as occurred elsewhere in Europe, uh, France, Scotland, and the Netherlands, Calvinism was really at the heart of renewed tensions and conflicts over um, competing truth claims. Calvinism was not officially recognized in the Holy Roman Empire by the Peace of Augsburg, but it gained a strong foothold in the Holy Roman Empire when Frederick III, 1559 to 1576, of the Palatinate converted to Calvinism. And you can see the areas that are that make up the Palatinate. So they're divided into two. There's a, a lower Palatinate there on the left, and then there's an upper Palatinate on the right. And it's worth noting that the upper Palatinate uh, borders with the state of Bohemia, and that's going to be an important thing to remember. The other thing about the Palatinate is the, uh, the leader of the Palatine was also one of the seven electors. Uh, and the major city in the Palatinate was Heidelberg, and it became the Geneva of the North, attracting religious scholars uh, devoted to Calvin's ideas. They institute uh, a Calvinist type of government uh, in Heidelberg uh, from which to spread uh, the faith. And it's going to be there in the Palatinate that in 1608, we have the formation of what was known as the Protestant uh, League, or the Protestant Union, I'm sorry. And the Protestant Union came together in 1608, um, as the Protestants became tied up in a an internal conflict over who would become the next Duke of the Duchy of Cleves, um, and Juliich, 
Now that's a, a smaller duchy. Um, the duke had died with no heir, and so the Catholics see uh, this as an opportunity to take back territory, regain control of the Duchy of Cleves, uh, but the Protestants also see that same opportunity. So the Protestants are going to form a union uh, led by the Palatinate, and if the Protestants form a union, um, then I think it's clear that the Catholics are also going to form uh, their own union, which they do. Uh, one uh, interesting note is one of the uh, six wives of Henry VIII actually was uh, from the Duchy of Cleves, so she was German. Um, that marriage didn't work out, uh, as you know uh, probably by now, that uh, most of Henry's marriages didn't work out. Um, so here we have um, the response to the Protestant Union was the Catholic League organized by Maximilian of Bavaria. Um, and Bavaria is in the southern uh, areas of the Holy Roman Empire. And Maximilian was a very devout Catholic um, who used the Jesuits um, to launch a series of, of missions uh, within his lands of Bavaria, but in neighboring states, to reclaim uh, uh, the, the supremacy of the Catholic Church and also to work to eradicate um, the heretics. So this is going to uh, set the stage um, for uh, uh, the Thirty Years' War. Now I'm going to go back to uh, the Palatinate just for a second. Um, in 1613, um, Frederick V of the Palatine actually marries the daughter of King James VI of Scotland. King James VI of Scotland was the son of uh, Queen Mary Stuart who was executed by Queen Elizabeth. Um, this should be confusing to you. Uh, these dynastic arrangements and marriages were meant to draw nations closer together uh, uh, so that these nations could pursue their uh, geopolitical uh, goals. Uh, and so one of the goals of the, again, the Palatinate was to extend Calvinism, not only defend, but extend Calvinism. And uh, they sought out the uh, protectorship then of a much larger nation named Scotland, which itself had converted to Calvinism. So I think that's the, the process and the mechanism. So we're going to move uh, on to uh, a rather interesting little uh, story here. Um, a group, uh, a series of mysterious writings appeared uh, in the year 1614 to 1616. Uh, and these writings um, were uh, attributed to a mystic by the name of Christian Rosenkreutz. And Rosenkreutz, uh, uh, we later find out, re really never existed. Uh, there was a series of, of Protestant writers that were writing about the idea, of uh, these mystical ideas about the redemption of the world uh, that was going to take place with the Protestant Reformed religions uh, spreading and expanding in the empire and, and uh, actually challenging the Catholic faith and the Catholic ideas about uh, faith, salvation, and the end of the world. And there's this really wonderful um, allegory here uh, that's, um, that shows the Rus Rosicrucian, after Rosenkreutz's last name, so the Rosicrucian ideas. Uh, and and these writings also promoted the idea that Prince Frederick was going to be the redeemer and the restorer of peace in Europe. And again, it was going to be a Calvinist uh, uh, faith and truth claim that was going to restore uh, peace. And I think you can see some rather interesting uh, images here uh, in, in this uh, woodcut, um, and it's worth kind of looking at. Um, now, um, I guess I would ask the question, what do you think the response of the Catholics is to uh, these mystical writings and to the uh, idea that Frederick V of uh, this small area of the Palatine was going to be Europe's uh, ultimate savior? Um, and I think that's where we'll end this lecture as you guys contemplate that. And we get into the first phase, the Bohemian phase.